Hello and welcome back to the Blood Stupor Podcast. My name is Luke Morgante, and in this episode, we sit down with Dr. Nina Kaiser, an expert in criminal procedure law and criminology from the University of Graz. During the conversation, we discuss the importance of her recent research into the lives and transatlantic relationship of Hans Gross and John Henry Wigmore, two individuals that contributed profoundly to evidence law and criminal sciences at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. I hope you enjoy, and if you would like to learn more from Nina Kaiser and her work, please follow the links in the description. All right, so to start, Nina, could you tell us a little bit about where you're from and what your academic interests have been to this point? Of course. Uh, Thanks for having me. So I'm originally from a very small town in Upper Styria. So I'm from Austria, to get started with that. Um, I studied law at the University of Graz, um, did my PhD or more or less doctorate here also at the University of Graz, where I first focused on uh, Hans Gross, um, the history of criminal sciences, and why it is so important to think criminal sciences or more or less the law interdisciplinary. And that's why I started my PhD thesis um, and did some work uh, on that. And so I started the Hans Gross Center on Interdisciplinary Criminal Sciences uh, back in June 21. So you've mentioned Hans Gross, and the title of your grant was Comparing Two Masters of Evidence, Hans Gross and John Henry Wigmore. Uh, Could you give some background on who Hans Gross was (laughs) and his significance, as well as John Henry Wigmore? Yeah, sure. So uh, I don't want to correct you, but the title was Reuniting Two Masters of Evidence. So it was very important to me to to get the picture, to reunite them again. Yeah, where to start? Maybe I'll start with some kind of historic context. So we're talking about criminal sciences here. And that's a very hard topic to talk about internationally because there are no homogeneous uh, terminologies on what is criminology, what is criminalistics, what is forensic sciences, what are criminal sciences. So that's a bit hard always, especially if we talk internationally. So just to clarify that, when I talk about criminal sciences, I mean uh, legal and non-legal sciences that deal with crime, to put it simply. And to provide some historical context, um, when I'm talking about Hans Gross, you have to imagine um, the 19th century, where uh, torture has been abolished, Um, The Inquisition trial has been abolished, and on the other hand, the principle of free evaluation of evidence has been introduced. And the 19th century in general was, you know, a believer in science, and it was characterized by positivism and empirism. And so Gross comes into the picture now. He is a jurist. He also studied law, like myself, at the University of Graz. And then he started in the practice. So he became a public prosecutor, uh, then a judge. And then he he started his um, career in academia. And what makes Gross life's work so important is that he more or less founded the interdisciplinarity of criminal sciences. Um, He was instrumental worldwide for the development of criminalistics as an independent field of study. He urged that criminal sciences must be understood as comprehensively as possible. And there he emphasized that special evidential value of factual evidence acquired through non-legal disciplines. So he insisted on an interdisciplinary approach and demanded that disciplines outside the law have to be consulted at all times. And... That was so important about him. He was a jurist and he basically said, okay, all jurists out there, we have to apply the sciences because we have to deal with facts in proceedings. And so we have to have a basic understanding about the sciences we are dealing with. So what were these sciences uh, outside of law that, I mean, they would basically, most, that were most typically referred to? Yeah, okay, most typically he was speaking about the natural sciences. Um, He was also instrumental in um, 
the development of a series of methods, methods for crime scene work, like for securing and evaluating traces. And he also basically laid the foundation for criminal psychology back then. But he was also talking about, you know, um, sociological, uh, statistical, economics, about anthropology, basically every science out there. That's really interesting. And to what extent did Hans Gross and John Henry Wigmore know of each other? (laughs) Yeah, okay, that's a good question now. And I think I have to start with like who Henry Wigmore was, right? That's very important because John Henry Wigmore was a professor and dean at an American university. He was a dean and professor at Northwestern University in Chicago at the law school there. And he's also considered like one of the most important legal scholars in the history of the United States. Um, His work laid the foundation of modern American evidence law. And I don't know, some of it, like one of his books is even called one of the greatest books on law ever written. And so we have on the one hand, Hans Gross, who is considered as the father of criminology or interdisciplinary criminal sciences. And on the other hand, this very important law professor in the US. And so, yeah, great question. Like how did they meet? How was that even possible? Because we have, ima- we have to imagine that um, we are finding ourselves in the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century. And so there was no, you know, WhatsApp or Instagram or LinkedIn where the two guys um, could have met each other. Um, so my theory is that they somehow get in touch concerning Hans Groh's famous work on criminal psychology. And why do I think that? So it's a bit hard to describe, but maybe I can just like tell you how I did I originally come up with the project idea. Maybe that helps to reconstruct also the relationship between the two. So I think their paths probably crossed uh, on the basis of course criminal, uh, criminal psychology, as I already said. It was first published in English in 1911. And it is signed by Wigmore in a foreword. So that was very interesting to me. Um, In addition, we know that Wigmore's preliminary bibliography of modern criminal law and criminology, which was a bibliography of criminological literature published worldwide, um, was also in Gross Library. But how we came up, or I came came up with the idea of starting a project was because one of my supervisors, he did some research on Hans Groh's uh, very famous extensive library on criminal sciences. And he came across Hans Groh's last will. And in his last will, he mentioned John Henry Wigmore. Uh, he urged his wife actually to get in touch with John Henry Wigmore regarding his extensive library. And the supervisor I mentioned um, told me about it. And I was like, what, who is John Henry Wigmore? And, and what, what, what is the connection there? And so I started um, some research. I looked up who is uh, John Henry Wigmore because in Austrian uh, law, you do not learn about uh, John Henry Wigmore. So I had to start it from scratch to do my research. And then I found the university, um, I mentioned the Northwestern University Law School, and I came across um, their university archives because they actually have um, an own collection on John Henry Wigmore, the John Henry Wigmore papers. And so I digged into that and I found that they have an extensive collection on John Henry Wigmore, but also on his connections to um, researchers abroad and I came across some collections of Hans Kohl's and that they even have ex- exchanged letters uh, in the years 1909 to 1913 at least and so I don't know how much I should talk right now about my research uh, because I got lost somehow in answering your question <laughs> no that was perfect I was actually <laughs> the next thing I was curious about was how this Austrian criminal scientist, uh, jurist, however you want to yeah. uh, 
uh, frame him and John Henry Wigmore all the way in the United States. How how linked was the relationship between these various criminal scientists, despite being in completely different countries? Uh, <laughs> and how how does that link back to their own judicial systems? Like how much does the work of these criminal scientists on an academic front trickle down to the real judicial practices? Yeah, so I already explained a bit that Hans Groß was instrumental for shaping um, the you know disciplinary criminal sciences in Austria. And so uh, back then in the US, the situation was different. They had to deal back then with um, rising crime rates, miscarriages of justice. And so I came uh, across numerous documents that provide evidence of John Wigmore's efforts to discuss and adopt the European concept Gross actually uh, developed. Um, he started with some colleagues, of course, not only himself, started discussions around the criminal justice system and the law back then. And they saw that there were efforts in Europe to understand the criminal sciences as a comprehensive interdisciplinary discipline. But however, these disciplines continued to work independently of each other in America. And Wigmore and his colleagues were not very satisfied with the situation and started to, to foster discussions about the European model. And for this reason, it's a very important point, the American Institute of Criminal Law and Criminology was founded. And the Institute's um, aim was to uh, create cooperation and to have a complete study and sanctioned solution of each part of the problem. And they saw that you have to um, integrate um, the law, of course, but anthropology, penology, psychology, police studies, sociology, and everything. And so with the start of the American Institute of Criminal Law and Criminology, I think it all, um, yeah, you know, the whole process got started on thinking more European, on thinking outside the box, um, crossing the borders, <laughs> to put it like that. And how they, they their paths crossed was that one of the main goals of this American Institute of Criminal Law and Criminology was not only to get in touch with international scholars, especially with European scholars, but they wanted to bring the European ideas to the Americans. And their approach was that first, the Americans' level of knowledge had to be brought up to a, let's call it, European level. And therefore, their primary goal was to um, make accessible the relevant literature in the field. If we think of our own like situation now, I would just, I don't know, go on Amazon or go to a local bookstore and get me an American book on evidence law. But that was not possible back then. So they had to translate the books. They were in a different language. They were across the Atlantic. And so they had to come up with a plan on how to make the knowledge accessible for Americans. And so the American Institute of Criminal Law and Criminology uh, started its own comedy, uh, committee on translation of European treatises on criminal sciences. And they had a special committee on the progress of, of you know, legislation and everything. But what's the most important fact is that they had their own comedy on translations. And Wigmore was, was the chairman of this comedy. And so the main task was to provide the American research community with access to the most important international publications in the field of criminal science, with the main goal to adopt the best principles and methods. And the comedy uh, came together, and one of the first books that was selected by the comedy was Hans Groß' Criminal Psychology. And what my research revealed now was that um, Wigmore was very instrumental in this. He was not only the one that actually initiated the translation of the criminal psychology, but he also handled the whole translation pro process as a link between the publisher and Hans Groß. And that was very interesting to me because the process seemed to have been <laughs> very challenging. And it was very hard to get a translator back then who had the, the, the knowledge in the field, 
uh, who had the language skill needed. And on the other hand, and that's a, a bit of funny fact, maybe if I can bring into that too, um, it had been agreed with the publisher that Gross would go on a, let's call it lecture tour uh, to America uh, to promote his criminal psychology. And also we have to imagine different times. So Gross did not just, you know, hop on a, an airplane and next day uh, be in America and uh, hold, uh, holding a lecture. Um, yeah, it was a bit, bit difficult. So they exchanged letters over months and this trip actually never happened. And the funny or a bit sad thing is that this was not due to any, I don't know, monetary problems or so. It was even Gross fee, Hans Gross fee was even tied to the travel act activity. So the publisher wanted him to go abroad and there was money there for it. Um, but and, and what year around was this? Oh, sorry. Um, I don't have the year right now. Um, must have been like 1910-ish. Oh yeah, I mean, the, the criminal psychology was first published in English in 1911. And so okay. his, his uh, promotion tour would have been in 1911-ish somehow. But I can look that up because I have all the letters, you know. <laughs> uh, but somehow, you know, 1910, 1911, they discussed the whole traveling to the US thing. Um, but what, what I wanted to say is just because it's somehow weird to, to think about that because Gross was this very important figure. He was the father of criminology back then. He was so well received internationally and he did not go on the trip because he doubted his own quality of his English skills, more precisely his pronunciation. And he canceled his trip because of that. He even took lessons in English to get his, you know, um, pronunciation better. Um, but in the end, he wrote John Henry Wigmer a letter and said, sorry, I can't go because I would fail. And that is a very uh, interesting aspect of their relationship um, and also about Hans Gross. But nevertheless, what's more important, the serious and the criminal psychology was a complete success. And so the criminal psychology was one of the first books that actually got published in the modern criminal science, science series. That was the, the name of, the, of his collection of knowledge transfer from Europe to America. It's, it's funny that you mentioned how difficult the vocabulary itself even was because the vocab was so technical and specific to the field at the time and the translations weren't as prevalent, but it seems like German would be the perfect language for creating the vocabulary for <laughs> criminal psychology because you can just put the words together. Right. <laughs> but um, uh, so as they're developing these fields and standards of evidence at the time and the, the field of criminal psychology itself, what are some of the differences to what they were focusing on then and what we kind of take for granted or what is canon within the field now? So that's a very tough question. And I'm not sure if I, if I got it right, but um, what we take for granted now is that we integrate other sciences into the criminal justice system, especially when we're thinking about this um, crime scene work. You know, we all know these numerous CSI series, true crime podcasts, movies, documentaries, where we can all watch the most sophisticated techniques in criminalistics. That, that all, that was not there back then. We have to imagine a time where they basically um, build their cases on testimonies. Um, and so back then, that was just not the case what we have now in crime scene work. And also, um, how do I put that? Maybe just the, the international community focusing on this very important aspect because we're uh, now confronted with a lot of transnational crimes too. Back then, it was just very hard, you know, to, to get the connection to, to my cooperations. Um, but I think what we are lacking now, at least in Austria, and that's a very important point why 
we have started the Hans Groß Center for Interdisciplinary Criminal Sciences because Hans Groß was very successful, as I already mentioned a hundred times. And he always stressed the fact that lawyers have to get educated in an interdisciplinary manner so that they understand the facts. And now in Austria, we find ourselves in a situation where this is not the case anymore. We somehow lost this interdisciplinary process um, over the years. And so we started to, to get this started again. And I'm not an expert in the US, um, in US academia, you know, or, or in the whole system, how the US educates their future lawyers. But what I can observe is that the US somehow managed to, to keep a more interdisciplinary approach in the legal sphere. And what I can also observe is that in the US, a lot of what Hans Groß said is still there in the criminal justice system when it comes to evidence and to um, look at evidence in a, you know, um, critical way to take the evidence not for granted in the first place and to also question the value of the evidence presented in court. Does it seem like the Austrian and American systems are more similar nowadays or are there still big gaps in how the two countries approach criminology? So that's also a very tough question. And for me, it's always very, very difficult to speak about the U.S. because of your states, you know, it's not just the U.S. You have more 50 different criminal justice systems within your system. So it's very hard for me to compare our system with the U.S. system. But when it comes to um, basic um, observations on approaches, um, I can say that, unfortunately, or in some cases, I'm glad that we are different. <laughs> this is also very hard because um, when speaking about approaches in criminology, we have to make sure that we're speaking of the same same question. Are you speaking of, in general, um, criminal justice or um, prison systems or um, law and evidence? So it's a bit hard for me to to hop on to that question because it's just too broad. What stood out to you most between the approaches of the two and what what seemed the most similar? You mean back then or now? Back then and <laughs> if if it if it overlaps with now then yes. Um, okay. I guess between the two of them. So Back then, what overlaps was just the, the effort of integrating non-legal sciences into the legal sphere. So that was the overlap back then. Hans Groß did that in a very successful manner years and years and years before the U.S. even started to think about that. And then the U.S. Um, caught up on that and they tried to get the same path. They... Um, they try to integrate the non-legal sciences like Gross urged to do. Do you believe there were any other areas, either in the context of evidence law or its historical evolution or the relationships of Wigmore and Gross that could use further research or that you weren't able to get to this time around? Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to imagine myself at the archives at the Northwestern University, having four weeks for my research. And I found myself, um, I don't know, more or less buried in documents over documents. They have such an extensive collection on documents about Wigmore and the development of criminal sciences back then that I would have, have, I don't know, studied for a year or so if I would have the time. So there is still, I'm sure, a lot to discover. Um, I can maybe just um, give you some ideas of what my main topics were that um, I'm trying to dig into more deeply now, because I think in every single aspect, you could definitely do more research. And I came across some other names and institutions 
that might be interesting to to do further research on in this whole um, context. So first of all, I already mentioned the modern criminal science series, like this transfer, this knowledge transfer back then through literature. There would be a lot, a lot of research um, to do because it was not only forced criminal psychology, but also uh, Wigmore tried to uh, get Hans Groh's most famous book, the Handbook or Manual um, on Criminal Investigation, published in the Criminal Science series. And he did not manage to do so because it was already published back then in English, but as an Indian version, because it was published in Calcutta in 1906. And so I wondered, like, why? Why would you even put so much effort into that when it's already published in English? And but they both of them, Hans Groß and Wigmore, insisted on that because they said it is a version that is adapted to the Indian uh, principles back then and to the whole Indian circumstances back then and not to the American. But they did not manage to do so because the publisher back then was not able to negotiate successfully with the publisher uh, in Madras. And so we are ending up, and I think so, and this has to be, you know, looked into that more closely again, because I think the English language version we have now from Hans, Hans Kohl's handbook is still the Indian version. And there is no real American or generally English version as a simple translation of the handbook. But what gives a lot of work to do in my point of view, and would be very important to understand the beginnings of criminal sciences, like in a transatlantic point of, from a transatlantic point of view, if you want to um, look at the developments and how they shaped each other, Austria and the US, would be to look into one of the first scientific crime detection labs that was um, actually um, built up at the Northwestern University in Chicago back then. And that was very important to me. That's, I think, maybe even the most important fact I came across, because I've never read about that before. Um, as I already told you, Gross had a very particular influence on how we dealt with criminal sciences back then. He managed to give criminalistics as a holistic um, discipline, a home at the university by uh, founding the first criminalistics institute on university level back then. And also Wigmore pushed such endeavors. Um, on one hand, he, he tried to get a professorship in criminology and on the other hand, and that's very noteworthy on this point, is that he was very instrumental in the foundation of the so-called Scientific Crime Detection Laboratory. And this one is the first of its kind in the US and it was founded in 1929, almost 20 years after the Institute in Graz was founded, but even before the first FBI laboratory, because this one was founded in 1932, uh, which was also based on the work of the Northwestern Lab. So that was a very important point for me. I tried to look into that more closely. And I still have a lot of documents to, to, to get through. But as far as I can for now is that the initiative to start this forensics lab was um, a came from a major called Major Goddard. And he was a ballistics expert back then. But he had the support from John Henry Wigmore. And they, again, started a committee on, you know, is that really important? Do we need a laboratory? And they filed some opinion after they finished their research on, do we actually need such a lab? And their recommendation stated that the comedy believes that back then nowhere in the US was a crime detection lab um, that was ad adequately equipped and prepared to apply you know, all the sciences and arts needed for the detection of crime, like all said. They observed developments um, outside America, in, in Europe, of course, like in, in Paris back then, in Berlin, in Vienna, in Rome, um, also in Lausanne, in Switzerland. But in their recommendations, they explicitly mentioned that 
Hans Groß is the one that gave the chief impulse of their establishment and that they really want to speak out for the for the development of such a lab at their university in Chicago um, by following the recommendation from Hans Groß. And so I looked into that and I tried to get some information about the lab back then. And I did, did some research while I was still in Chicago. I did not plan to, to spend a lot of time on a scientific crime detection lab because I just did not know. Um, so if I would have had the time, I think I would have spent another four weeks just on trying to discover more about uh, the scientific crime detection lab. But what I could find was that they really tried to, to do it like Groß did in Graz. They created the lab. They gave the lab, of course, a laboratory, but also a library and a museum and its own publication medium, the American Journal of Police Science. Because also Groß had at his very famous Kriminalistic Institute in Graz, had a lab, had a library, had a museum, and had its own publication medium. So they really tried to do it like Hans Groß did. They also, like Hans Groß did, gave students the chance to work on real cases under the supervision, of course, of lecturers. Um, and yeah, they also offered seminars for practitioners like Hans Groß did. They also offered seminars for public prosecutors, for the police like Hans Groß did. And of course, also for students. And it was just so, I don't know, mind blowing for me because um, when you think about Hans Groß and you do research about Hans Groß, um, you often come across, you often come across people that say, yeah, well, Hans Groß, we all think that he has somehow influenced the FBI. But I did not come across any actual evidence um, so this was, for me, I don't know, the most important fact I could find because it's just something so new. They even, I don't know, to, to tell you more about it, they even wanted their students to, to have Hans Groß handbook. Um, if they wanted to enroll in a class, I think the class was called Methods of Scientific Crime Deten Detection, and the students had to get Hans Groß handbook on criminal investigation and read it before the course as extensively as possible. And so all the things that happened within the scientific crime detection laboratory are things that should be researched even more to understand the actual, the actual effects of Hans Groß as father of criminalistics in the US. Yeah, that's so, it's so interesting to me how how many changes and how much these fields have developed in the past 150 years alone. It seems mm -hmm. like the actual breakthroughs are still so recent that the history is still catching up to it and yeah, kind of illustrating how it all unfolded. But it's, it's so crazy to me how recent it all is, but how prevalent it is also within our society. Right. And uh, also you, you mentioned the, the book being, translated uh, in Calcutta and how they didn't feel it was a true translation for I guess yes. American audiences or American schools do you have an opinion on that yourself you think that it should still be translated differently or not necessarily yeah that's also an interesting question and I think I cannot answer it right now we would have to do more research on that part because it haven't have been researched. I, I still don't know um, what the differences are in the German version of the handbook and the, the English Indian version of the handbook. So we would have to compare or we would have to provide a simple a translation of the German Hans Groß book and then compare it with the Indian version because I really don't know how, how different it, it was how Hans Groß, like in, in what capacity Hans Groß changed it, how much is it that is actually different? Because it might be a lot, but I just don't know. I think that it can't be that bad because uh, John Henry Whitmore decided to, to get the book 
Uh, nevertheless, for some police students and other classes he offered, he still urged his students to, to get the book. Not only students at the law school, but also for police officers. So I think they were still of the opinion that it can be used as an Indian version, also for American purposes. So I just don't know. I think it's not a big deal to not have an American version, but we would have to look into that. Yeah, that's so that's so interesting. Now I want to know the differences too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I would love to look into that. Um, so finally, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to discuss or that you were looking forward to? Um, I think I already talked a lot about my project. It's just, I wanted to say thank you, um, for making this possible. Um, I'm sure you know how hard it is in academia to get funds for research projects. Um, especially funds that enable you to go abroad for a couple of weeks to do your research in quiet because you really need some time alone with your research to do the ex actual research. So I really appreciate the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. It's a very important topic in my point of view. Even in Austria, where Hans Kloss came from originally, we don't have a lot of research in the field. Um, so I really appreciate that this was possible and I would love to look into all the details even more when I find the time. So currently I'm more or less um, starting to, to go through all the documents I collected because as you might imagine, it's just insane how many documents I collected in Chicago and I could not look through every single document by now. The thank you goes to Dietrich Bochtieber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, maybe I just what I wanted to say is that I think we should totally try to develop ourselves and our techniques, but somehow it and sometimes it would be good for all of us in the criminal justice system to think back and to remind ourselves of why we came this way. And so I would love a bit more of Hans Kloss right now in academia and also in the criminal justice system. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed the podcast, keep an eye out for new content across our various social media platforms linked below. You can also find more from our guests and their work in the description. The Bochdieber Institute for Austrian American Studies promotes an understanding of the historic relationship between the United States and Austria, including the lands of the former Habsburg Empire, by awarding grants and fellowships, organizing lectures and conferences, and publishing the Journal of Austrian American History. We engage with a broader public audience through digital programming, including videos, podcasts, and blog posts. Auf Wiedersehen, and see you next time.